We're in Indianapolis, Indiana. It's September 5th, 2002, and seconds remain in a FIBA World Championship quarterfinal game between Yugoslavia and the United States. This is the world's most important international tournament outside the Olympics, basketball's version of the World Cup. And the typically dominant US is losing by three points. Before they attempt a final shot, we need to remember how a presumptive basketball superpower arrived at the brink of disaster, how these guys came to represent the host country. And similarly, we need to understand how this Yugoslavian team got here, how a changing, conflicted world reshaped sports. We need to rewind. So the first thing I want to talk about is American attendance. It's disappointing. Conseco Fieldhouse seats 18,000 people, but has been at well under half capacity throughout this tournament, forcing organizers to cut ticket prices. 5,300 people are here today, and as has often been the case, plenty of them are rooting against the host country. That probably has something to do with the attendance on the court. This is the final possession of an international elimination game and the lineup representing Earth's preeminent basketball playing nation is Andre Miller, Reggie Miller, Paul Pierce, Jermaine O'Neal, and Antonio Davis. On one hand, coach George Carl has given this Indianapolis crowd some pacers to watch, so that's nice. On the other hand, while these are all good players, they are far from the best America has to offer. So yeah, we need to talk through some USA basketball history. In 1989, FIBA changed its rules to allow NBA players to participate in international competition. This came after years of teams like the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia skirting the amateurs only rule. Those countries found ways to roster professional players while American teams were made of college kids. Very good college kids, but still actual amateurs. A rule change permitting all pros was met with some consternation from various American interests who would rather close the loophole for others than open it for themselves. Some worried American NBA players wouldn't want to play. Conversely, former USOC President Robert Kane said it would be a sad day for the Olympics if a team like Kenya had to face Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. The rule went through, but an NBA to Team USA pipeline wasn't in place by the 1990 FIBA championship. College players like Kenny Anderson and Alonzo Mourning represented their country in Argentina and won bronze. But by the 92 Barcelona Olympics, Team USA hadn't just incorporated NBA players, they had stirred up enough interest to attract the best NBA players. Larry Bird and Magic Johnson didn't play against Kenya, but they did kick off the games by beating Angola 116-48. Starting with those Olympics, professionalized American dream teams bulldozed everyone, everywhere. They went undefeated for a gold medal in 92, undefeated gold medal at the FIBA World Championship in 94 in Canada, undefeated in gold at the 96 Olympics in Atlanta. But the pipeline was beginning to thin. The 1998 FIBA championship happened in the middle of the NBA lockout, so the U.S. sent a ragtag bunch of players from other leagues to scrap out a bronze medal in Greece. If you can name any of these people, you really know your basketball. And even after the lockout, the 2000 team wasn't very dreamy. Shaq and Kobe declined invites, Tim Duncan and Grant Hill were hurt, no Iverson, Malone, Weber, the list goes on. That squad kept the undefeated streak alive and won gold in Sydney, but way too narrowly. The Americans had to gut out some tough wins against France and came one rimmed out Lithuanian buzzer beater away from losing in the semifinal. They were so close to blowing it. If you think that near miss sparked a return of NBA superstars to Team USA, you would be mistaken. All of these people passed on this FIBA World Championship. Jason Kidd and Ray Allen pulled out because of injuries. George Carl's USA roster came down to this. A good group of players, but I mean, the best centers are Jermaine O'Neal, who's better at power forward, and Ben Wallace, who offers basically nothing on offense. Without Allen, the best shooter is 37-year-old Reggie Miller. Without Kidd, the best point guards are Andre Miller and Baron Davis, both light on big game experience. These guys, Nick Collison and Jay Williams, have yet to play pro ball at all. The top scorers are Paul Pierce, who just made his first NBA All-Star team, 
and Michael Finley, who's one of nine guys here who didn't make it this season. So the US played multiple games in this tournament in which one could argue the best player on the floor wasn't American. Germany's Dirk Nowitzki dropped 34 on them. China's Yao Ming was a very tough matchup. But it's not just a lack of star talent, it's chemistry. Team Argentina employs no NBA players, at least not here in 2002. Their leading scorer is some dude the Spurs drafted in the second round a few years ago who's been playing in Italy, Manu Ginobili. But on the final day of group play, just yesterday, Manu and the gang became the first team ever to defeat a USA squad composed of NBA players, ending a run of 58 straight wins since 92. It was a huge deal for Argentina and their fans who, justifiably, celebrated a convincing victory like they'd won the whole thing. Ginobili was frank about the advantage his team had. The Argentinians practiced and developed alongside one another. They know each other. They fit together. The Americans? Not so much. Teamwork defeats star power. Although I feel like if the US just brought better stars, that wouldn't be true. Either way, the loss didn't diminish the Americans' cockiness. After that historic defeat, point guard Baron Davis said, it's not the medal round, we'll be back to win the gold. Well, here we are in the medal round, and Team USA has been shaky. Leading scorer Paul Pierce got in foul trouble early on. Coach Carl has depended on Ben Wallace to score in the post, and as you can see, Ben Wallace is not great at that. The US keeps wasting foul shots, especially Jermaine O'Neal, who airballed one of his four straight missed free throws in the fourth quarter. Honestly, this game should already be out of reach. But Andre Miller hit a contested bailout three with 38 seconds left, then tossed a gorgeous pass to hometown hero slash oldest player on the team by a long shot, Reggie Miller, who was cutting back door. And even after all that, defeat looms. If these guys can't tie the game with a three, the US won't win any medal, let alone a gold. After 10 years undefeated, USA basketball could lose twice in two days. But remember, even against kind of a JV American team, every country in this tournament except Argentina has come up way short. So to understand this score, we've got to dig deeper into these players representing Yugoslavia, which means something very different than it used to. Throughout the 70s and 80s, Yugoslavia was right up there with the US and Soviet Union in contention for international basketball medals. In the 1990 World Championship, that last American team of college players fell in the semifinal to a stacked roster of pros from Yugoslavia, including a couple who'd become NBA stars. One of those stars, Vlade Divac, is here today, 12 years later, and owned the Americans in the first half. At 34, Divac is much older than any of his teammates and just months removed from his Sacramento Kings heartbreaking Western Conference final loss to the Lakers. But Divac is a big part of this team and taking this tournament so seriously that he's given up smoking for the week. That's a big deal for Vlade. Divac torched the American big men, muscling against Wallace, drawing contact against Antonio Davis, and putting the moves on Elton Brand for 16 points in the first half not to mention his usual slick passing to cutters. But look around and you'll see no one else from the 1990 Yugoslavian squad. Yes, a lot of time has passed, but that's not the only reason. After winning that 90 FIBA gold, that team and the nation that produced it would fracture. The Yugoslav Wars, a series of independence movements and ethnic conflicts way too complicated for me to explain in an episode of Rewinder, led to the breakup of a long-standing nation that had competed in international basketball since the 1940s. Even while winning gold at Eurobasket 1991 in Rome, the ethnically diverse team experienced tension, with one eye on the conflict at home. The war directly affected them when Yuri Zdovc withdrew from the team before the semifinal to appease the Slovenian independence movement. Instead of one collective team, the 92 Olympics included teams representing some of the now independent former Yugoslavian constituents. Only Croatia, home to stars like Drazen Petrovic and Toni Kukoc, competed in basketball, winning silver to the original Dream Team's gold. Notably absent in Barcelona were the Serbians and Montenegrins from that old Yugoslavian team. Their nations had formed a new Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and were banned from international competition because of UN sanctions in response to the war. They missed several consecutive international tournaments, including a 94 World Championship they were originally supposed to host in Belgrade. 
The ban lasted up until the Dayton Accords in 1995, which made that year's Eurobasket the official return of quote-unquote Yugoslavia, really just Serbia and Montenegro, to international basketball. It was a triumphant return. With some new blood joining the holdover veterans, Yugoslavia won Eurobasket 95 in an all-time great final versus Lithuania, then two of the next three Eurobasket goals. They won World Championship gold in 1998 and mixed in an impressive silver medal run at the 96 Olympics. And the second half today has been all about the new generation, the guys who never played for the original Yugoslavian team. Dejan Bodiroga, who helped pioneer the dribble move Americans most closely associate with Providence College legend God Shamgod, has busted out that very move here in Indy. A double-digit American lead in the fourth quarter evaporated thanks to threes from Milan Gorovic. Marko Jaric, who just signed with the LA Clippers, has hit all four of his clutch free throws down the stretch. But Yugoslavia's clear star is a player NBA fans now know well, 25-year-old Peja Stojakovic. The Kings drafted Stojakovic in 1996 and brought him over from Europe in 98, the same year they signed Divac. After a couple years on the bench, Stojakovic broke out in 2001 as one of the best three-point shooters in the league. This season, he made his first All-Star game, became the first European player to win the NBA's three-point contest, and yeah, might have won a championship if not for the brutal, contentious finish to that conference final against the Lakers. In this second half, Peja has hit a couple of big threes, finished off a gorgeous feed from his Kings teammate, and canned a couple important free throws down the stretch. Page is leading the way, but all of these guys will be national heroes if they can get a stop here. So who are they stopping? It's looking like one of the Millers. Reggie is one of the greatest three-point shooters ever, and in front of an Indiana crowd would be the perfect hero to send this to OT. He's also 37 and dragging a sore ankle. The 26-year-old Andre, no relation, is best known as a passer, but he's been the US's best all-around offensive player today, for lack of a better option. And that really is the theme of this ordeal, win or lose. When they were still the only basketball superpower obeying the amateur rule, the Americans lost now and then. When that rule came down, they completely took over. But NBA players aren't showing up like they used to, and this underwhelming American squad has already suffered defeat. Now it could happen again, versus a team that bears the same name as an 80s powerhouse, but draws from a much smaller, although still impressively deep, pool of talent. It's gonna come down to a Miller. The beloved but old Reggie looks like he's gonna pass this off to the overachieving Andre, who needs a bucket to save the US from humiliation. Let's see what happens. Welcome to a moment in history. Andre Miller got three to Tari. Astoki, Botiroga, Mazepitibana, Tobe Hribi Tayoni, Tobe Hribi Tayoni, Tijo Koslavia. Thanks for watching Rewinder. If you want to see a couple of these American players get into trouble a couple years later, check out this episode or watch any of the episodes over here from all different sports.